Well, good morning, everybody. You are the early rising crowd, this Daylight Savings, and we're so glad that you're here. And we also want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. Welcome to our spring mission celebration, and we have a lot in store for you today. And so we have a special service planned, the first half of the service. We all get to be together, those in the room and online. And then for the second half of the service, we're going to split apart and we're going to have C and K sharing with us in person in the room and a special interview message for those joining online. And we can't wait to hear from all of our guests today. And so this is our celebration. We call it a celebration because we have much to be grateful and celebrate today. And really, it's just that we have good news and our good news is Jesus. And so we're going to celebrate that today, both within our own lives and with news of what's happening all over the world. And so would you please stand and sing with us?
Amen. You can have a seat, and I just pray that we're walking in that freedom today. And I'm going to share with you a few announcements as our kids come on up. Our coffee connection time between the two services is happening again today and then the weeks moving forward. And so I hope you'll take the time to pop out to the gathering area after the service and join us for some drinks and fellowship together. Um, today, there is no kids Sunday school or reverb discipleship for our teens, and we just hope that they can join us in the sanctuary today for this special service. Um, if you are new here today, we would love to meet you. We would love to just say thanks for being here with a little gift. And so after the service, stop at the Welcome Center in the foyer in the entry there, and somebody will greet you and get that little gift for you today. Um, we'd love to be praying for you. So any ways that we can support and pray and lift you up, uh, we would love to. Please send us a message on Facebook Messenger. St send us an email. Stop us in the hall and let us know those prayer requests. And so as we shift to a time of giving where we give our tithes and our offerings to the ministries of the church, um, we want to let you know that this time right here, the baskets as you leave the sanctuary today is for our general giving fund. Later in the service today, we're going to have this opportunity as we celebrate missions to go through our faith promise giving to missions for the year. So today, right now, the time of giving is going to be for our general fund. And so the kids had the opportunity to gather yesterday morning and learn some special things from C and K. And so now they're going to share with us today. Dass du da bist, einfach spitze, dass du da bist, einfach spitze, komm, wir loben Gott den Herrn. Einfach spitze, dass du da bist, einfach spitze, dass du da bist, einfach spitze, komm, wir loben Gott den Herrn. So, und jetzt stampfen, aber so richtig. Einfach spitze, lass uns stampfen, einfach spitze, lass uns stampfen, einfach spitze, komm, wir loben Gott den Herrn. Einfach spitze, lass uns stampfen, einfach spitze, lass uns stampfen, einfach spitze, komm, wir loben Gott den Herrn. Das macht ihr richtig gut. Lasst uns zusammen Freude und Spaß haben, lasst uns zusammen klatschen, einfach spitze. Spitze, lass uns klatschen, einfach spitze, lass uns klatschen, einfach spitze, komm, wir loben Gott den Herrn. Einfach spitze, lass uns klatschen, einfach spitze, lass uns klatschen, einfach spitze, komm, wir loben Gott den Herrn. Jetzt können wir auch noch hüpfen, bis an die Decke. Einfach spitze, lass uns hüpfen, einfach spitze, lass uns hüpfen, einfach spitze, komm, wir loben Gott den Herrn. Einfach spitze, lass uns hüpfen. Einfach spitze, lass uns hüpfen. Einfach spitze, komm, wir loben Gott den Herrn. Hey, das geht gut. Oh, was fehlt noch? Ach ja, tanzen. Einfach spitze, lass uns tanzen. Einfach spitze, lass uns tanzen. Einfach spitze, komm, wir loben Gott den Herrn. Lass uns tanzen, einfach spitze, lass uns tanzen, einfach spitze, komm, wir loben Gott den Herrn. Kid, you did just a great job. You got the words out and the movements out a whole lot better than I'd ever accomplished, so... We had just a great day yesterday, by the way, both with the kids' section and the adult section. Just a wonderful time. 
Well, our church has supported Matt Blake for a number of years, and he's more than just a missionary to us, kind of a dear friend. And uh, I had conversation with Matt this week about the situation in Ukraine and Russia. He serves in the Czech Republic, and uh, that country's not that far away. And actually, their church has been... Um, uh, supporting and some refugees who have moved into the area trying to get away from the ravages of war. So I'm going to have a little interview with Matt this morning and uh, so glad you can be a part of that. So Matt, greetings from your friends from Spooner Wesleyan Church. It's been just a, a joy to share life with you and uh, uh, I know you're back in the area now. How are you doing and how is your church doing? Hi, Pastor Ron, uh, and to all of you there at uh, Spooner Wesley, and thanks for letting me join you today. It was great to be with you in November. I really uh, appreciated that time. That was a special weekend for me. We're doing okay here. Uh, church is doing well. We're able to continue our activities. We're busy. There's extra things going on right now, right? So, uh, but we're doing okay, and thankful that um, we can continue to meet and, and pray together and worship together in the midst of all that's going on right now. So, Matt, I know uh, that so much Obviously, we're just... very... Oh. I know that so much has changed in the last 30 days with the conflict between Russia and Ukraine and uh, impacting the whole world, and I know impacting your country with refugees that are escaping at this point. I wonder if you could kind of share with us how you're finding ways to help the people from Ukraine. Uh, obviously, we're very aware and watching the situation as it continues to unfold. In fact, sometimes it's, it's in these kinds of situations we probably need to take time to back away a little bit because it can be so overwhelming with all the information and uh, with all the need that's there. Some of the ways that we're able to help uh, just as a local church is that we're able to collect things. Um, and we collect them for two purposes. We collect uh, items, bedding and, and food and clothes, all those kinds of things that would be needed uh, for those who come. Uh, there are people coming every day into our city, um, and we're housing some in our ministry center, and people in our church have opened their homes willing to uh, house people as well. So we collect things for those who are arriving. We've put together, in fact, our youth put together welcome packs that would just have some basic things. So when people arrive and they've had to just kind of grab a duffel bag of things and leave their home, that they've got some things. We want to provide that. Uh, we provide and, and buy sometimes and collect items to send back in. Um, so when we can uh, hear about specific needs or ways to get things in, and then we partner with organizations or people who are heading into Ukraine uh, and be able to get things in. And we've heard of some children's homes that have had to completely uproot and move. And so there's a whole need of providing things or, or churches that are in need. And so as we hear of needs, we collect and send things in. And then we, we collect funds as well. And we pray uh, that God would help things come to a good resolution, but also that he would be standing with those who are in in Ukraine and uh, and what we can do to communicate with them and encourage those who we know or others that we've come across. So Matt, a week ago, our church donated $2,000 to the Wesleyan Relief Fund, and I know that was to help out Ukrainian people. I'm wondering how money like that gets used, and also if there are more ways, Matt, that we could be involved besides our giving and our praying. Well, thanks so much for the gift that you guys provided. We um, are quickly realizing that the needs are great, and, and we are so thankful for a generous group in our church and other churches around in Europe, the Wesleyan Network, the Wesleyan family of churches we have, but the needs are 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 just huge, right? So uh, that that those kinds of funds really help us to continue to do what we can to provide when there are specific needs. Sending money into Ukraine sometimes isn't even practical, but but it also doesn't help. Sometimes in, in some of the areas, stores are empty. Uh, they can't buy goods. They can't go to the store and get the things they need, even if we got them some money. So the funds that we're able to collect and use, we are able to buy supplies and send back in to those who are in really desperate situations right now or to provide 
for these families who are coming out, had to grab bags, come out with almost nothing so that we can do that. That really helps us. Thanks for the prayers as well. Uh, you know, this is a God-sized problem and we need, we need uh, God really to um, move, um, to work to change the situation. Beyond that, you know, I, I don't know that there's um, anything specific that I would say. Those are, uh, those are really helpful things uh, to allow us to continue to work in these things. I would just encourage, though, this is a time of where countries that used to be kind of brothers in a, in a way are now fighting. And um, there's a lot of strong emotions. I would encourage us to maybe take this opportunity to reach out to people who are different. Maybe who people we haven't uh, necessarily always reached out to. I, I hope that the church, and this is what we're seeing out of Ukraine, uh, and, and I think so many of our churches, but uh, I hope that our church around the world is known as people who love those who are hurting, those who are not in a great situation, those who are maybe uh, in a different place. We're quick to, to recognize divisions, but man, that we would be quick to love those who we can and help in practical ways. So we definitely need the help to get it to Ukraine, but I know there's situations really close. I, I would hope this is an inspirational time where we're just saying, hey, we need to be a church that is reaching out to those who are hurting and in need. So Matt, it's so good to connect with you this morning, even if, if by, by video. We just so appreciate your faithfulness to God and, and to people. I wonder, Anything you'd specifically ask us to pray for you, Matt, or for your church family? Well, thanks again for letting me share for a bit uh, to give some update on, on things that are going on here. You know, as you pray, uh, sometimes those situations, and I felt this too, these situations can seem like they're so far away, right? They're on the other side or they're way, way far away, but when we sit with people, those who have had to flee their homes because it's not safe anymore and families are divided right now, you just feel the weight of that. And so um, for me personally, I, you know, if, if you want to pray for me, I, there's bigger needs, right? But if you want to pray for me, I just I would appreciate prayer for strength and the ability to care, but not be overwhelmed. I think this has been a really emotional time and there's a lot of weight to it. There's a heaviness to it, to what we, um, what we can do, what's going on, what we can't do. So I'd appreciate prayers just for being able to manage and be strong and to lead, not to, we're all weak, right? <laughs> We'd rely on his strength, but I'd appreciate prayers. A lot of communication. A lot of needs, so it can be really exhausting. For the people in our church, pray that they, we, we as a church would continue to find those ways to personally give help. I, I'm reminded that while there are hundreds of thousands of people fleeing out of Ukraine, that those numbers can seem almost too huge, that actually it's people, it's personal people. And when we have a chance to touch a life or a family's life and come alongside them that we can in that way personally be the hands and the love and the grace of God. Pray that we would be able to do that well with the people we come into contact with and the ones that we're reaching out to that we know who are in Ukraine, who are communicating with us, that we would be the personal touch of God's love, that they would experience God's care for them, that they're not forgotten. I think that's a prayer for maybe the Ukrainian people, the our brothers and sisters who are there who are hurt who are still continuing to reach out with the love of God, continuing to share about his grace and his hope, that they would be encouraged, that they would know that they're not alone, that we stand with them, that we're praying with them, that God is moving them. And, and you know, that's something that God's spirit can do that sometimes we're limited in. We can send a message, but God's spirit meets right with them. Pray that he would in powerful ways. We heard an example when there was uh, one of our friends there in Ukraine, as the bombing was going on, as the as the missiles were flying overhead, and they heard those, and they're bunkered down underground, hiding. A young lady with children that she cares for, and some mothers. She pulled out her guitar. She began to sing praises to God, and I just think God is meeting with people. It brings back the the memory of Paul and Silas right in the prison, and they pray, and God shakes the ground as they worship Him. And there are so many who are locked away right now and pray that, that God, as he is present with them, that, that they would find hope and strength to carry on, that he would provide for their needs, that somehow in God's wonderful, amazing way, that he would again shake the ground. Those who feel locked away right now would experience the powerful move of God. Pray that this thing can be done quick. Pray that there would be a resolution. 
And that might be in, in God's own way, in God's own time, but we can pray and seek peace for the Ukrainian people, for the Russian people, for the people now across Central Europe who are receiving people from Ukraine. I'm so thankful that as we stand in God's family, it means we don't stand alone. Thanks for standing with us. And I pray that your day will be one filled with being reminded of God's greatness and his goodness. We're thankful that we serve a God who stretches across the world and meets our needs. Thanks for being a part of that today. Church family, we need to pray. So whether you're online with us this morning or right here in the room, let's just go before our Father. Oh, Heavenly Father, these things that Matt has been talking about The Ukrainian situation, like you said, can seem so many miles away in a whole different part of the world. And yet, actually, it's all so near. For people, our people, our people, we are all just people incredibly valuable, created in your image with hopes and dreams and families we love and struggles and fears and particularly when those things most important in our lives are being threatened to be taken away or destroyed. And God, this is what is happening to the people in Ukraine right now. And we confess we're not smart enough or know enough to speak into this situation as world leaders. But we do pray as your people. We pray as your people for your peace and for your intervention and that you would somehow stop the madness, oh God. Please stop the madness and bring resolution to this dire situation that's rocking the world. And use Matt as a spiritual leader there in a neighboring country, the Czech Republic. We pray as he asks that you would give him the ability to care but not be overwhelmed. And to manage the heaviness of leading in this situation and to know what he can and can't do. And give Matt your supernatural strength in the midst of these hours and days and weeks and perhaps even months of exhausting ministry before him. We also pray for the people of his church family. Thank you for the ways they are taking Ukrainian refugees into their homes. Enable them to show the love of Christ one person, one family at a time. We also pray for our Ukrainian brothers and sisters in the Lord who are hurting today. May they sense the love of Jesus even in the midst of the awfulness of their situation. May they know they're loved by you. And may they be able to communicate your love to those hurting so badly around them. We pray the gospel of Jesus may shine dark and this shine out in this dark situation. And, oh, God, may you in the end get the glory. We know this is not the first crisis you've been through and probably not the last. And you are not shaken, though we may be. So we entrust this situation to you. We entrust your people to you. We entrust our dear friend and brother, Matt Blake, to you. It's in Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen.
You can have a seat. And um, I wish I could be in two places at once here, both online and in this room today. So we're doing this special format in an effort to honor all of our special guests. Um, they have different security needs, and we want to protect their work and their relationships with the people that they're serving. And so that is why this is a unique format today. So for those of you online, um, we're going to turn you over to hearing an interview from Pastor Ron and a couple special guests. And for those of us in the room, Room here today. I'm going to now turn this over to Todd Kipe. Thank you. So as Pastor Morgan just shared, we have a couple of special guests who are joining us in this next section of our online service today. And the first person we're about to meet is a young lady whose name is Courtney. And Courtney serves as a long-term worker in Eastern Europe. So welcome to you, Courtney. So glad that you can join us and share in this time with you. Maybe a place for us to start is by asking, what is it that you do as a long-term worker in Eastern Europe? Hey, Spooner Westland. My name is Courtney, and I'm currently a long-term worker in Eastern Europe. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to be with you this morning and to partner with you in the work the Lord is doing around the world. Our work here in Eastern Europe includes many different things. For me, it primarily looks like language learning because I am so new to the field. At least 20 hours a week, I am engaging in learning language with a language helper, studying on my own, and practicing with anyone who's willing to just speak with me. In addition to that, I oversee our uh, communications at our World Hope International office here in our country. And through World Hope International, we offer an educational resource center to our town and hopefully expanding into other towns around us. And it's through this that we believe that all people should have access to quality educational opportunities. And through this, then people have opportunities to encounter the gospel. And so we offer things from language courses, including English, to partnering with teachers and schools to uh, offer programs like anti-bullying things and um, opportunities for people to receive more tutoring or whatever it may be. We're working with locals, we're working with the community to enable all people to have quality educational opportunities. In addition to all of this, Probably most importantly, what our team is doing is we're engaging in intentional quality relationships. We believe it's through trusted relationships that people really begin to uh, have spiritual conversations and to desire to know more about God. And so we have specific people that we are pouring into and hopefully it'll turn into discipleship and Bible studies in the future. Um, it's through these relationships that spiritual opportunities happen, that prayer is engaged, and that people begin to become more curious about God because we're living life with them just a little bit differently. So that's a little bit of an insight into what we're doing here in Eastern Europe. So Courtney, if we could back up just a bit, let me invite you to tell more about yourself, a bit of your backstory uh, some of the shaping influences when you were younger that have had greatest impact upon who you are today. And my journey to Eastern Europe began from the very first day I was born on the east side of Indianapolis, Indiana. I was born into a family of pastors, and that is where I fell in love with the local church. I learned about God. I grew in my personal faith. And I discerned that he desired for me to love God and to love others wholeheartedly. And it was through things like Westland Youth Conventions and continual discipleship of my parents and my first uh, trip to Costa Rica and the ways in which the Lord just continually kept revealing to me his desire to work with all people and the beauty of all people around the world. And this only grew further and further as I grew in my faith. Uh, right around eighth grade, my mom was diagnosed with cancer and she later died when I was 17. 
And this really caused me to have to examine and discern who God was and what he meant to me and why are there bad things that happen in this world if our God is so good and truly loves us. And so that became a really turning point for me in trying to make my faith my own and it was no longer what my parents were telling me. And so I went on to Indiana Wesleyan University where I fell more deeply in love with the Lord. I saw him reveal his goodness and truth to me in new ways. And I had my first trip to Eastern Europe right after my sophomore year. I fell in love with the people here and the culture here, and I was starting to discern that maybe this is where the Lord was having me go in the future. And it was through that time period that I had many encounters with people and opportunities to share the gospel in ways that I didn't expect or imagine. And even on my first day in Eastern Europe, I sensed the Lord say to me, I'm making a place for you here. And he continually showed up in that moment again and again. And so that is just a little glimpse into my journey. I, after graduating from Indiana Wesleyan, went on to Asbury Theological Seminary and received my Master of Arts in Intercultural Studies. And I am fresh to the field. I just got to our country here uh, at the end of July 2021. And so it's been about seven months, uh, but it's been a good seven months so far. So Courtney, what does a typical day or week look like as a long-term worker? Uh, What do you do? How do you spend your time? people you meet, that sort of thing. A typical day in Eastern Europe is centered around coffee. Coffee is the center of culture here where we live, and people will often spend at least three, maybe four hours talking to each other and drinking coffee. And oftentimes, that's where you will find me or any one of my teammates hanging out in cafes and talking with people. And it's through these conversations that we often find we have spiritual opportunities and time to get to know the locals in the area and what they really care about. And so coffee is always a part of my day, no matter how long it takes. Uh, Life here tends to be a little bit slower than how it operates in America, and people value relationship more than they do necessarily time. And so people will choose to spend as much time as somebody wants having coffee because they value that relationship so much. Uh, In addition to that, it may look like different meetings with teammates or um, opportunities around town. Every day just looks a little bit different than the other. Um, But often we are also in our World Hope office offering courses on English, practicing one-on-one with people, uh, trying to come up with creative ways to share the gospel, uh, prayer walking, and even engaging in worship together as a team. And one of the actually more fun things that I do here in Eastern Europe is I combine one of my favorite hobbies of baking and trying to connect with people and share the gospel. So because coffee is such a central part of our culture, oftentimes so are sweet treats. So I have become known in this place for making cookies and making specifically American cookies and uh, usually have been using that to even Uh, share scripture or prayer or just to love on my friends and people around me. And so baking is often something that's a part of my week in many different facets. Um, In addition, I run. My teammate and I just ran the uh, half marathon this past weekend, and that's a really great stress reliever and opportunity for um, even praying over the ground as we're running and just um, being able to engage with nature. And speaking of engaging in nature, our team is very active. We live in between mountains and we often are found hiking, rock climbing, um, canoeing, kayaking, all different kinds of things. 
So that's just a little bit of an insight of some of the things that we do in a typical week or day in Eastern Europe. So in Eastern Europe, Courtney, the country where you serve, would you say that people are open spiritually? Are they hungry for God? Do they like to talk about Jesus or not so much? The spiritual climate where we live in Eastern Europe is actually very interesting and difficult to navigate. Um, people are not very open or interested in God because the two major world religions have left people to be nominal and to be stuck in religious traditions rather than to be in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So our team of six adults, we are the only evangelical believers within a two-hour radius of us in the, this country. And another major world religion rules this country more than anything else. And people think that they are in a relationship with God, but in reality, they are living more of idolatrous lives that are stuck in traditions and religiosity more than they are in knowing who God is and what he calls us to be. So people are not encouraged to pray on their own they're not encouraged to read their Bibles if they have Bibles and that's the religion that they're in. They're not encouraged to live lives of holiness in pursuit of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ every day. And they really do not know um, the truth of the gospel. And so we're trying to navigate this difficult spiritual climate. Most people are not even open to having spiritual conversations. They will not ask for prayer, and they do not desire to know Jesus Christ at all. And so even our presence here, our lives living differently than how they're used to doing and speaking differently, encouraging each other, having hope and joy and love and knowing the goodness of God, sparks some curiosity in people because we're just a little bit different than who they are. And it's our hope that things like prayer and um engaging in trusted relationships and really hearing and listening to people and the things that they think they believe or that they do in their lives or that they've been told through religion and trying to speak the truth of the gospel through those things and have interfaith dialogue with them. And then hoping and praying that through the provenient grace of God, the grace that goes before, would enable them to believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. And we would begin to see Bible studies happening, house churches that would be led by local leaders, people would be made new by their identity in Christ, and ultimately that this country would become a hub of the church rather than a place of deep hopelessness. And are the people you're getting to know, Courtney, um, by and large hopeful or more discouraged and fearful or even hopeless? And who or what do they turn to to give them hope? Two of the most common words that we actually use to describe people in life here in our country is hopelessness and purposelessness. Because of the effects of communism, the most recent war, constant takeover, a continually failing economy, and a lack of opportunities, people live lives without hope and they live lives without purpose. And they do not know where to turn to or uh, what to turn to. And this has left them to live lives that are empty and often full of shame. And so it is something that is very uh, sad. It is something that is sober and uh, we are constantly working to deal with and trying to help people think and dream and understand what life could potentially be and what does it mean to change your community and those kinds of things. And so uh, we are continuing to working and praying that the gospel would intercede in this place so that people's lives would be made new by their relationship with Jesus Christ, that thriving house churches would be led by local leaders, and ultimately that 
communities would be healed by reconciliation and forgiveness, and the hope and light and truth of the gospel would reign in this place, and that people would no longer be stuck in shame. They would no longer be stuck in despair. They would no longer have to live in uh, religious traditions that leave them to be nominal, but they would be able to live in the true life, the real life that we can live in for eternity. And Courtney, if you don't mind me asking you a personal question, uh, you're living far away from home these days, away from family, away from friends, and there must be some times when you struggle with loneliness or maybe discouragement when the progress is slow. Just a question, why do you do what you do, and is it worth it to do what you do? And while life and work is hard here, and it is certainly lonely, especially being a single person on the field, it is 100% without a doubt worth it. And while we may question that some days or a lot of days and wonder why would it ever be worth coming here? Will the gospel ever take root here? Our team has come and those who have gone before us have come here knowing and believing the truth that Jesus Christ has called us here, but also that he is continually working and moving in the lives of people. And it is up to us to live our lives in faithful obedience to whatever Jesus has asked us to do. Even so much so that my dad told me my entire life that you do whatever Jesus tells you to do, no matter what it is. And that will always be worth it. So even though the soil is rocky, that people do not want to hear the good news of the gospel, We come knowing and believing that the truth of the good news will fall on those who can hear, that people will desire to know Jesus Christ, and that all people should have the opportunity to hear and know the gospel. And so we live with that hope. We live with that anticipation that one day we will be able to stand with our brothers and sisters from Eastern Europe, offering up praise and glory and honor to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords for eternity, as it says in Revelation chapter 7. And that will always be worth it. So whatever it is Jesus is asking you to do, just as whatever he's asking me to do, it is always worth it, and you should do it with faithful obedience. Courtney, it's such a privilege to be able to meet with you today via video. We feel like we know you a little bit better now than we did before. So I wonder as we close out our time, if you have prayer concerns that you would want to share with us. Thank you for the ways in which you fervently pray, faithfully give, and continually encourage uh, me and others around the world in the work the Lord is doing. It truly is an honor to be able to partner with the church in whatever the Lord is doing around the world. And uh, there are certainly ways in which you can specifically pray for us here in Eastern Europe. One, our team has had the specific focus in 2022, asking our partners and praying ourselves to the Lord that he would give us boldness. We are asking that the Lord would give us boldness to creatively and innovatively share the gospel in ways that maybe we haven't done before or in refreshing new ways. And in that, we are asking that we would be in step with the Spirit to be able to discern and know how to and when to share the gospel with people in every encounter that we have. And since we've done this, we have seen an increase in spiritual conversations and opportunities to uh, share scripture and pray over people. And that is something that we celebrate and we are um, continually praying over and asking that the Lord would work and move in those people's lives so maybe these can turn into Bible studies and uh, eventually house churches. Uh, So we are grateful for that. We would also ask that you would pray over the entire situation that is happening in Eastern Europe. I'm sure that you all are aware of uh, what is occurring currently. And in these unprecedented times, we are asking for specific prayer over how to minister to the people that we live alongside. While we are not 
currently directly affected by uh, what is happening in Eastern Europe and the conflict there. Uh, we are dealing with people who are living lives in uncertainty and are certainly stressed by that. And they are also dealing with some post-traumatic stress uh, from trauma that they experienced in the war that they most recently had. Uh, we would ask that you would pray over our country, that you would pray over the political tension that is happening here, that you would pray for us, that we would be able to minister to people well and to truly do and live a ministry of presence with people and to be able to speak the truth and hope and love of the gospel and be people of peace. Um, and that you would pray over the entire conflict. You would pray over leaders uh, throughout Eastern Europe that peace would reign and discernment would occur and that this conflict would completely dissipate. We know and believe that our God has the ability to do immeasurably more. And we pray that out of this entire situation, more people would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and that he would reign throughout this entire world. Thank you again for letting me join you. It is an absolute pleasure, like I said before. So church, let's uh, bow our heads and take just a moment right now to pray for Courtney and for her team. Let's pray together. Father, what a delight it is to get to know Courtney better today through this interview. We do pray for her and her team and for boldness and sharing the gospel in ways that connect and make sense to the people where she lives. Would you give her and her team spirit-directed discernment in how and when and, and with whom to share the good news of Jesus? Open doors, Father, to spiritual conversations and opportunities to share Scripture and pray. And in time, O oh God, may, those, uh, may there be many who find Jesus to become real and alive to them in ways they've never known before. And people who start gathering together around your word and Bible studies and even eventually starting house churches. Father, we do pray for the way the conflict in Ukraine is impacting people in the country where Courtney lives, those who are experiencing higher levels of anxiety and even post-traumatic stress. We pray for your healing and your peace, not only in Ukraine, but where Courtney lives and all over the world, so that when all is said and done, many will come to see Jesus as the only real hope for the whole wide world. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So we have one more interview. Again, a 20-something, a young lady named Bryn, who serves as a young or a long-term worker in Central Europe. So Bryn, a warm welcome to you from the people here in Spooner, Wisconsin. And as a way to get us started, Bryn, what do you do as a long-term worker in Central Europe? Hi, Pastor Ron and Spooner Wesleyan. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be here and to share this time with you. Uh, I'm really grateful for your guys' ongoing prayer and support, so this is fun to be able to connect with you in a different way. As a long-term worker in my country, it looks a little bit different for me than it might for someone else because this is my first ministry term serving abroad. So my first term is actually three years, and during this time, I'm focusing mainly on language acquisition. I spend 22 hours a week working on my target language, part of that's in class, in conversation, just listening passively or watching movies, being around it, doing the day-to-day -day things like going to the grocery store or ordering food in my target language. So that's kind of, that's the main deal right now. And then secondarily, building relationships, getting to know people, investing in them so that we can have those meaningful and spiritual conversations that lead to talking more about who Jesus is. I'm also involved in some of the different projects that the ministry team I'm a part of is working on. We're based out of a community center here, so we teach English classes, I have conversation club, English camp, a couple different things that are going on on a regular basis there. So I'm a part of those, but with them as a secondary focus to learning language and just really beginning to settle in and feel at home here. And Bryn, if you would uh, please share a bit of your background story, including key influencers in your younger life that have most impacted who you are and what you do today. 
Growing up, I think one of the biggest influencers for me was that I'm a part of a pastor's family. Uh, my dad is a senior pastor and he has been since before I was born. My mom has always been his counterpart in ministry and now is actually the co-host for a Christian radio show. <laughs> uh, but their investment in me as a kid was just awesome. My dad was a church planner for a really long time, so growing up at five years old, I remember fighting with my brother about who got to sit in the front seat of the minivan with all the church equipment in the back at 5 a.m. in the morning to go and set up in a local elementary school cafeteria. I was always invited to be a part of the ministry that was happening. I loved it. My siblings and I had each different parts of the church that we would set up and were trained to help with, not because we had to, but just because we wanted to. So I loved growing up in the local church and I loved every opportunity that I had to serve uh, through that. My mom homeschooled my siblings and I until I was going into sixth grade, then she put us all in school. But during those homeschool years, she actually used a missionary curriculum. So I heard stories all the time about how God was at work around the world through missionaries and how he was using them for his glory and to spread his kingdom. One of those missionary stories that has just, I've never been able to shake it, has always stuck with me, is that of Amy Carmichael. If you haven't read Amy Carmichael's story, I'd really encourage you to do so. She was a missionary in India and just did a ton of incredible and really valiant work. Um, as a little girl, I wanted to be Amy Carmichael and I was so disappointed because uh, one of the things that allowed her to do the ministry that she was doing in India was that she had brown eyes. And she hadn't liked her brown eyes growing up, but she came to realize that God gave her brown eyes so that she could do the work that she was doing. So I was really incredibly disappointed that I did not have brown eyes. <laughs> and Bran, in the country where you serve there in Central Europe, are people open spiritually or not so much? Are they open to talking about God, uh, talking about Jesus? What is the spiritual climate there? That's a good question. I would say that the country where I serve has some pretty strong atheistic roots. Uh, they're known for that. People rely on what they know, on education. Uh, I have uh, one really good friend who's a really strong atheist, has a lot of hard questions about God and how the world could be the way that it is, why the Crusades happened, like how history has not we have not always responded well. And how do we own that with people who we want to invite to know Jesus, but are stuck on just the hurt that Christians have caused? So I think that's something that's important actually for us to look to is how our actions, how who we are and what we post, what we say, how that affects how someone sees God. Because it really does, it puts up barriers and walls um, and we're see, we see a lot of that here in Central Europe. I would also say just that there's not really a hunger for God. Uh, it's pretty dark here. Uh, there's a lot of like, there is a lot of joy. People are incredible. You know, they're created in the image of God, but there's this darkness here and it's tangible. It's felt. Um, instance that just comes to mind recently where I realized it was just a reminder of how deeply people here need to know Jesus is that I was on my way out with friends uh, who are believers and we were walking and one of our friends who we were going to meet up with wrote us and said, oh, hey, I'm so sorry. Like the train was delayed. I'm going to be late. And I said, oh, no, like he's going to be late. And my friend who I was walking with said, oh, yeah, it was probably another suicide. And that just like caught me completely off guard that that would be the assumption that the train was delayed because someone had chosen to take their own life. So it is a difficult area to work in and people aren't always open to that. And Bryn, on a, on a lighter note, what do you do for fun? Uh, what do you do to relax? Fun and ministry, just really the line is so blurred. They overlap so much because I love to rock climb, but when I'm rock climbing, I am intentionally investing in the relationships with my friends there. I like am asking questions about their lives. I'm looking for opportunities to share spiritually, uh, like bringing topics around to, that could lead that direction. Like, so it's, 
it's something that's fun that I really enjoy, but it's also very intentional in building that relationship. And that's what a lot of my friendships look like, I would say, like, uh, yeah, really that fun and ministry overlap a lot. And so sometimes uh, we talk about this on my team. It is blurry. How do we discern what is fun and what's intentional ministry? What, what are our ministry hours? Like, we do not have a typical work day in any sense. Um, but yeah, in addition to rock climbing, the really time having coffee with people, hanging out, uh, I do intentionally schedule time with people on my team because when people on my team and I can get together for fun, it's all English. <laughs> There's no language barrier and it's just a time where we can fill each other up and invest in each other. So I would say those times are really sweet. And then the last thing I would add that I do for fun is the international church that I'm a part of is just really, really cool community. And the biggest population, I think, at that church is Brazilian. So in stark contrast to the culture that I live in, which is very, like, cold culture, there are, I have friends who are just like, ah, Brian, and, like, give those big, like, swinging hugs. I have one couple who are really good friends uh, from Brazil who I really enjoy spending time with them. They're just super bubbly and fun and joyful and they love Jesus and yeah, it's I really enjoy opportunities to connect with them and with other people from the church as well. And Bren, as you're getting to know people, do you find them to be generally uh, hopeful and happy? or more discouraged and, and hopeless? Uh, and where do people turn to for help? You know, Pastor Ron, I think how I answer that question today is different than I would have a couple weeks ago because of the current crisis that's happening with Russia and Ukraine. The country where I serve is one that used to be under the Soviet regime, and so people, this really hits close to home for them. It feels just like a flashback to years ago when they were under the Soviet control and occupation. And there's just a lot of hard emotions that rise with that. People are preparing uh, for what if, what if we're invaded next? Like, what would we do? People are also just responding to the current crisis and what's happening. People are driving to the borders and bringing people further west. Um, we currently have refugees actually staying in our community center and are working on relief efforts and ongoing care. People in our area, there's not a lot of hope. Life is what it is, and when hard stuff happens, it hurts, and I think that people numb it a lot with alcohol. Uh, people are really proud of their drinks here, and they drink a lot. Uh, lunch, dinner, weeknights, all the time. Like, it's just kind of a regular thing that people turn to. I'd say also that maybe people rely a lot on their bodies and what they can do. Physical activity is just really a part of the culture here. People love to get outdoors. They love to go and do things. Um, but there's really just this heavy reliance on what their bodies are capable of and what they can achieve out of their own power, out of their own brains, out of their own smarts. So, yeah, people are really relying on themselves. And then when life gets too hard, dulling the pain uh, with alcohol, there's a huge need here for the light that Jesus offers. And Bren, you live a long ways from home here in America, a long ways from your home, your family, your friends. And I'm thinking you must struggle at times with loneliness, maybe even discouragement, when things don't happen as fast as you might hope. So why do you do what you do, and is it worth it to do what you do? The way that you worded those questions makes me think that a lot of times people will say, Oh, Bryn, like, you're so brave. I can never do what you do. And whether spoken out loud or in my head, my response is, I'm not brave. I'm obedient. I don't feel brave doing what I do, uh, but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has called me here, that he's called me to this work, that I'm supposed to be here. I see it in the relationship to doors that he's opening and how um, ministry is happening here and I get to be a part of it and honestly I just can't imagine being anywhere else uh, I think that the center of God's will for you is the safest place to be regardless of where where that is or what that looks like and I will be here as long as God wants me to be here and I think it is totally worth all the sacrifices that I make 
It's hard to be away from family. It's hard to not be there for life events or for things that are happening, not to be part of the day-to-day -day or to know that in some of the inside jokes that people are experiencing in their time together. But man, um, yeah, I know that I know that I'm supposed to be here and I can be content with that because God is good and he's faithful and I'm committed to serving him with all that I am. Brian, it's such a joy to meet together with you today via video. Thanks so much for your time. And I wonder as we close out this time together, would you have some prayer concerns that you would want to share with us? Thank you so much for spending this time with me as well. I really appreciate it. Um, going forward, prayer requests would just be for our continued response to the crisis that's happening in Ukraine. Pray for Ukraine, pray for Russia, Pray for God to raise up peacemakers. Um, pray for his intervention in the world around us and for his comfort and peace and grace for the refugees who are fleeing the situation. Pray for the countries and the people who are responding, who are going to the borders, picking people up, who are hosting refugees in their homes. Um, just the response is all around us right now and we're trying to discern where we can best, how we can continue to serve, where we can best serve now and in the days because the situation is just, is changing so rapidly. So if you could just pray alongside us in our response to that and that this would be an opportunity to share the hope that Jesus offers and that the darkness will be overcome ultimately by his light. So church, let's just take a few moments and bow our heads and uh, join together in praying for Brent, shall we? Father, thank you for this privilege of sharing time with Bren and to sense her heart for you and for people. We do pray for her encouragement and for your adequacy in her life in every situation she faces. And as she requested, would you provide wisdom for her and her teammates in these uncertain days of the Ukrainian crisis? And may they discern the best ways to be and to do and to serve and to come alongside others in love and support in these quickly changing days in which we live and to show Jesus as the light and the life and the hope of the world. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's one more thing I want to do before we close out our worship time together today. And that is to give opportunity for as many as are willing to participate in financial support for the sharing of the gospel with people all over the world. You know, here at Spooner Wesleyan, we refer to this as our faith promise giving, which is uh, our giving specifically to support missions. So in addition to our general giving, which supports the ongoing ministry of our local church, we also invite and challenge as many people as are willing and it's strictly voluntary, uh, to make an annual commitment to missions, a faith commitment, trusting the Lord to enable giving beyond your regular giving to the church over the span of this next year. And this is to share the hope with those who have not yet heard about Jesus, but to have that opportunity. We are convinced that Jesus is the hope, not only for us, but for people everywhere. And so the way we do that, practically speaking, and you'll notice the slide on the screen there, that there are several missionary personnel that we support, and we financially help send out people who feel called and to love people all over the world, and obviously it takes money to do that. And you'll notice there are several individuals or couples we support in that way. Also some general missions projects that we get behind, like World Hope International, which provides practical help like drilling of wells in countries that lack water or delivering young people from sex trade, all sorts of good things done in Jesus' name to help out in those ways. You also notice a category called Extension Missions Projects, and we have just added the names of Quentin and Rachel Mendenhall, uh, just sent out from our church family. Uh, pastor Quentin was a pastor here at our church the last couple of years, but he and Rachel and their son Fletcher just moved a week ago uh, to another part of the United States to serve Muslim refugees relocated there, building relationships with them and in time sharing the gospel. So that's another family, the Mendenhalls we've added. 
You'll also notice further down on that sheet several local ministries right here in Spooner and the surrounding area. For example, Kids Hope, where people in our church are mentors to at-risk children in our two elementary schools. Also, our local food pantry, Faith in Action, the list goes on. So what I'm asking you to consider right now, would you be willing to be a part of helping us reach people all over the world with the gospel? Our faith promise goal this year for the next year is $55,000, all of that being given to missions between June the 1st of 2022 to May the 31st of 2023. I'm not asking you to give money today, but rather would you consider making a faith promise commitment with the Lord's enabling? And then sometime during that next year, you would fulfill that commitment by giving to our missions fund. And I assure you that 100% of what you give will go to missions, either to missionary personnel or the projects that you see there on the slide. So if this is something you're open to, this is what I would ask you to do right now. Uh, Please go to our church website, uh, type in Spooner Wesleyan Church on your search engine, and that will bring you to our home page where you will find a banner that says Missions Weekend, God So Loved. If you will click on that banner, just click on the missions banner, that will take you to another page. Scroll down and you will come to a button that says Faith Promise Pledge. Click on the Faith Promise Pledge button and you'll find a line there, a dollar amount that you can fill in that you believe God is calling you to for this next year to missions. So you simply fill in your amount and then click submit and you're done. You'll notice that we're not asking for your name or any identification. Uh, This commitment of missions is strictly between you and the Lord. But what it does do for our church is it anonymously adds your amount to our overall uh, faith promise goal to see how we're doing uh, with those who are going to give this next year. So that's my ask. Would you be willing to do that? And thank you for whatever part you would play in giving to missions Uh, to get out the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to others. I want to thank you for joining us online today. Uh, This has been a special morning, a special weekend for our church family. I know I have personally been encouraged and challenged uh, by the guests who have shared with us today, uh, people serving people and serving God all over the world. And I am glad that you have joined us for this Spring Mission Celebration Sunday. Next Sunday, then, we'll be meeting together again as usual. And until then, may you know that God loves you, like Jesus says in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So live in his love this week.